when it was around 5% of our population is suffering from asthma. So why a person develop asthma, nobody knows exactly. Medical science failed to accept, uh, explain why a person develop asthma. Uh, but um, I mean, usually genetic predisposition, if there is, if anybody in the family is suffering from asthma, there is more likelihood that their offspring will have asthma. Another uh, condition which is very common in asthmatic patient, it is called atopy. Atopy is genetically inherited condition in which people react to the common allergens. They have got high IgE level. But remember that, I mean, in, in a good number of asthma patients, they will have atopy or high level of IgE, but not all asthma patients will have high IgE. And similarly, uh, all patients who have got a, a topy or high IgE level, they may not develop asthma. So it is not definite, but yes, genetic predisposition is there. And then exposure to allergens, particularly in early infancy. When in, because of the modern lifestyle, we have, have got carpets, upholstery, furniture, bedding, and all this causes a lot of accumulation of house dust mite and other allergens. Exposure to them in early infancy increases the chances of developing asthma. In early life, there are over 200 chemical substances which can predispose you to develop asthma. This is called an occupational asthma. So I'm not going to discuss that. That is a bit of speciality problem. Um, now, along with genetic predisposition and exposure to allergen in early infancy, uh, certain contributory factors are also important. As I mentioned to you, there are a lot of allergens like house dust mites, animal dander, cockroaches, fungi. They are all very common in our presenting occupational exposures. Uh, respiratory infection, particularly in the childhood, if you are born small in size, you are more likely to similarly die. Children who are not being fed on the mother milk in the first six months, they are more likely to air pollution, whether it's outdoor or indoor, both predisposes you to develop asthma. And last but not the least is the smoking. Whether it's an active smoking uh, by the pregnant lady or when it is she's been exposed to smoking i mean it increases the chances of uh, asthma in the child in the child born to that lady coming to the pathophysiology although it's a difficult thing but simple if we simplify usually the mast cells are considered to be the most culprit cells they've already got some preformed granules which are already there in the mast cells now once a person is exposed to an allergen um, the IgE molecules are being formed and they get attached to the surface of the mast cells. Subsequent exposure of the allergen, which is big enough to bridge the gap between these two IgE molecules, a series of reactions take place in these mast cells. Some of the mediators are already preformed, they are immediately released, like histamine, uh, thromboxin, prostacycline, and so on and so forth. Uh, then what happens is that these mast cells rupture and there are more enzymes and uh, uh, called phospholipase, which act over the lipids on the cell wall, and more chemical mediators are being produced, and they cause chemotaxis to the cells. The cells, I mean, the cells are being brought into the mucosa of the airways, and an inflammation sets in. So this is all what happens in these patients. Classically, asthma has got two phases: early stages, uh, which is early phase, which is called the bronchoconstrictive, and later on because of the subsequent influx of the cells into the mucosa, an inflammation sets in, and uh, this is the late phase of inflammation. So basically, initially patients come with a bronchospasm and subsequently they get inflammation in the airways and they go on having recurrent inflammations. I mean, I don't want to go into detail because this is a third year lecture, but this is a series of reactions which take place in these patients, allergen exposure, and then a lot of uh, leukotrins are being, uh, leukotrines are being produced and they get, I mean, released causing acute symptoms because of the bronchospasm and subsequently bronchial inflammation, which leads to hyper-responsiveness. And usually, I mean, a person has got a normal, nice balance between two types of helper lymphocytes, which is called TH1 type helper lymphocytes and Th type 2 helper lymphocytes. 
so uh, this sort of uh, balance is they are i mean the number of these two cells are well balanced but there are certain factors which shift or tilt the balance towards th type 2 helper lymphocytes and when you have more th2 helper lymphocytes you are predisposed to develop different allergic conditions whether it's a skin whether it's a nose or whether it's asthma so factors which predisposes you to have more th type 2 help, uh, lymphocytes are wider spreads of antibiotic adoption of the western lifestyle again that predisposes diet we have already discussed and presence of lot of allergens in your house uh, in your house they all tilt the balance towards developing more th helper lymphocytes and that's why people develop asthma so this is something in detail on the contrary if you are being uh, exposed to recurrent infection into the childhood if you have received tuberculosis uh, bcg vaccination if you are living in an unhealthy unhealthy environment this is called hygiene therapy hygiene theory so if you are living in such conditions you are more likely to develop frequent infection in the childhood so you will have more th1 helper lymphocytes and this sort uh, makes you a little bit protective against various infection in the adulthood and this is what we are seeing with the coronavirus also that in asian population uh, who have received bcg vaccination or who have been exposed to recurrent infections in the childhood are less likely to die from coronavirus uh, this is what the basic theory behind is this now there is a small movie which i wanted to show you uh, so which will explain you what all goes into um, this so if you bear with me i will just show you the thing which i have explained to you uh, let me uh, enlarge that so this is the cross section of the airway you can see that submucosa and these are the mast cells on which allergens get attached and when they bridge the gap between these two uh, molecules of ige on the surface of the mast cell the mast cell ruptures and these spiky things these are various mediators what they do is they in the mucosa there are certain blood vessels they tend to enter into these blood vessels there you can see that they are entering into the blood vessel there they are going into the blood vessel these are red corpuscles now there are certain uh, eosinophils can you see this big cell this is a eosinophil now these mediators will get hold of these eosinophil bring them out of the uh, blood vessels into the mucosa or into the submucosa and there these uh, cells ruptures and they also causes leakage of plasma from these small capillaries there you can see the, this is the chemotaxis the cells are being brought out of the blood vessel this is what we call as chemotaxis and there it will going to rupture and release more mediators these mediators then act on the smooth muscles of the airways and causes bronchospasm that is responsible for causing the acute symptom now if you see that uh, the diameter of the airways reduces in size so the patients develop symptoms of shortness of breath and wheezing so this is what happens there at the same time these mediators stimulate the mucosal cell uh, mucosal glands and these mucosal glands will produce a thick uh, mucus uh, and this mucus in the airways becomes thick and it is beyond the normal mucociliary clearance i mean it overwhelms the normal mucociliary clearance of the airways and that's why i mean patients have got a lot of cough and difficulty in expectoration because this is a very thick mucus so this is all in nutshell which i was trying to tell you happens in there so um let me go back to the presentation now so if you see in the nutshell this is what happens that the patients who are genetically predisposed if they are exposed to environmental allergens in the early life they will develop airway inflammation which leads to hyper responsiveness twitchy airways 
it causes narrowing of the airways and symptom of the asthma. So this is what all happens in a dead shell. So this is, if you see, as I showed you earlier, that there are two phases. When this is the normal airways, which looks like under the bronchoscopy, smooth and normal. But after exposure, there is a sudden bronchospasm and you can see the diameter of the airways have suddenly reduced in size. And subsequently, because of the more uh, cells coming into the mucosa, there is a mucosal inflammation in the airways. And this is responsible for causing hyper-responsiveness of the airways. Then there is a new concept coming in, is the airway modeling. Like if somebody has got a high blood pressure for a long time, you can get permanent thickening of the myocardium. Similarly, the airways also become permanently thick, again, due to subendothelial fibrosis, mucosal muscle hyperplasia, uh, mucosal gland hyperplasia. So all this causes the airway to become narrow permanently. Now, how do we diagnose? Diagnosis is all based on clinical history of the patients. The characteristic signs of asthma are three. That is cough, shortness of breath, and wheezing. You all know all these very common symptoms. So anybody with chest problem will have either of these symptoms, like cough, and everybody has got a cough. And a lot of patients will complain of tightness or shortness of breath. So it is difficult unless you have got a good history taken from the patient. So why, when you should suspect asthma, if any of the three symptoms, that is cough, wheezing, and shortness of breath, any one of these symptoms occur in the repeated forms, you should suspect asthma. Because this cannot happen that you are getting chest infection and again and again, and you are being given antibiotic and cough syrup and you are getting better. So whenever any of these symptoms occur in repeated form, you should suspect asthma. There are other clues in the history that if you have a family tendency or if you have got anybody in the family who has got an asthma, then it is more likely that it is asthma. If your symptoms of these symptoms of cough, shortness of breath have started in the childhood, then there is a more likely. If you are allergic to common allergens like uh, house dust, when somebody is cleaning the house, he gets cough, shortness of breath. <clears throat> Similarly, um, uh, exposure to pollens, uh, animal denders. I mean, all these common allergen, if precipitate symptoms, you should suspect as well. Now, how physical examination is not very important or not very useful in the diagnosis. Only when a person comes in a severe attack, then it is very obvious. So you don't need to have a lot of physical examination. But usually when you see these patients, they are very comfortable, except during an acute attack and they will have a lot of sinus symptoms. We can talk about that later. The confirmation is done with a simple gadget, which is called the flowmeter or spirometry. We will talk about the spirometry and the spirometry lecture. But this is even simpler than a spirometry. This is called a peak flow meter. What you do is take a deep breath in, blow big fast, as fast as you can, and this pointer will move outward. So uh, you will take a reading of that. And through that, by doing different things, you can diagnose asthma. Let me tell you one thing. Now, this is basically a spirometry reading. But what is the simple thing can be done with the peak flow meter also. So normally, somebody has got a P, uh, FEV1 or peak expiratory flow is a sero surrogate marker of FEV1. So if somebody has got an FEV1, which is here, this, this is her, his, his or her normal peak uh, uh, FEV1. Now, when he comes and his uh, FEV1 or a peak expiratory flow is low, you give them two puffs of bronchodilator. And if it improves significantly more than 15, more than 15, uh, 12 percent, or 200 ml from the baseline, this is called reversibility and you confirm bronchodilator reversibility and you confirm that the person has got asthma. Sometimes the patient may not come during uh, who has got an active symptoms, but they will come when they are feeling normal. What you can give is them either give them oral prednisolone or an inhaled uh, steroid and uh, you keep on recording every day ask them to record the peak flow meter. And for instance, if they've started with 200 and in seven days it has improved by over 12% or 200 ml, you can confirm this is called a steroid reversibility test. There is another thing which is very peculiar with asthma patient is that there is a change in the 
um, uh, peak flow, particularly early morning and late at night. So there is a change in the peak flow. This is a late at night and it is early morning. So all asthmatic patients will have more symptoms first thing in the morning when they get up. So this is called morning dip of the peak flow. Normally the peak flow was 500 and it has dropped in the morning to 400. So this variability uh, is called, is very significantly suggest that this patient has got an asthma. So you give them peak flow meter, make a diary, record when they get up in the morning and then later at night they should record it. So this is how we confirm that the variability is more than 12% and it is uh, typical. Even a normal person will have some degree of variability, but that will be less than 5%. Another test which is very typical for asthma, which is called exercise-induced uh, exercise induced bronchoconstriction. Normally, when you do an exercise, I mean, no matter you become short of breath, your peak flow before and after exercise either will remain same or immediately after exercise, it will improve because you have bronchodilatation. But asthmatic patients cannot have the bronchodilatation. So what happens is that if you check the peak flow, let's say it's 450 here, you ask them to do a six minute exercise and immediately after cessation of exercise, immediately after cessation of exercise, you will find that there is a drop in the peak flow reading. And if it is again more than 12%, you confirm that this is a uh, asthma. This is a very typical phenomenon. Quite a lot of asthmatic patients will complain when they are climbing the stairs. They don't feel short of breath, but once they reach the top or the landing, they suddenly become short of breath. So this is the same phenomenon which has only happened in asthma patients. There is another test which is done, which is called methacholine or histamine challenge test. I mean, both these drugs causes significant bronchoconstriction even in a normal person. But this is done and uh, bronchoconstriction at a very high, the normal person may require a very high concentration um, milligram per, hundred, per ml of 64 in a normal person. But if you have got hyper responsiveness, if you have got an asthma, even a very tiny dose of uh, methacholine or histamine will cause significant bronchoconstriction in these patients. So this is called... Uh, this is called histamine or methacholine challenge test. Now, management-wise, basically, you have to make an accurate diagnosis, try to eliminate as far as humanly possible those factors which aggravate your asthma. Appropriate treatment, education of the patient is very important, monitoring the compliance and adjusting the treatment according to the need. There are two types of drugs which is used in the management of asthma. One is called the reliever drugs, and other is controller drugs. Reliever drugs is just that relieve the bronchospasm or the bronchial constriction, and they should only be used as per required basis when you have symptoms. But controller medicine is basically addressing the inflammation which I have shown to you. So uh, this medicine has to be continued for a long time period of time, even if you have no symptoms, because it will not let the inflammation come in and you will not have attack. So this is a long list of quick reliever or preventive drug, uh, sorry, controller drugs, preventive drugs which are available in Pakistan, selbitamol, terbitamoline, eprotropium bromide, amenophilin, erlene injections. And similarly, we have got a lot of preventive medicine, but inhaled corticosteroid are the main stay and the main important preventive medicine, and that has to be used on a long-term basis. Both these medicines are available in different forms. Uh, whether it's an injection, it can be also available in tablet forms and syrup forms. But remember that inhaler are the best way of giving these medicines. So all patient of asthma should be treated with inhalers. Why? Because you see, when you give inhaler, the drug goes directly into the airway where it is required. So targeted therapies to the airway. A very small dose is required because it's going directly into that. Therefore, there will be no side effects or minimal side effects. So remember that all asthma patients should be treated with inhalers. And preventive medicine is given to almost all patients who have been there or who have got an asthma. So if you do not give them the preventive medicine, you will just relieve their bronchospasm. The inner inflammation, which I have shown you, will not be addressed. 
and therefore the person will have recurrent attacks. And here you can see that if they have been given inhaled uh, corticosteroids as a preventive medicine on a long term, the inside inflammation is gone away and the person will start feeling better and will not have an attack again and again. So again, inhaled corticosteroids are the most effective controller medicine and they should be used on a long term basis to reduce recurrent attacks and severity of exacerbation. Why inhaled corticosteroids are best? Because they act on all phases of inflammation. And it has also been shown that in countries where there is more sale of inhaled corticosteroid, the chances of a patient dying from asthma is reduced. And it is unfortunate that in Pakistan, not of many patients are using inhaled corticosteroid to control their asthma. Finally, I'm coming to the steps of management. This, it is usually in a stepwise fashion that as the severity of asthma increases, the number of controller medicine goes on increasing. Initially, in mild, moderate, you use one controller and then you go on increasing the asthma medication. Now, this is the latest guideline in which reliever medicine, which is a short-acting beta-2 agonist, should be given as per required and controller medicine should be given that is inhaled corticosteroid on a regular basis. Similarly, if you go on having a little bit more severe asthma, then you give them again inhaled corticosteroid and preventive medicine as per required. But if you have got moderately symptoms asthma, you may add on another drug which is called long acting beta 2 agonist along with inhaled corticosteroid. So these are to become preventive medicine. Again, if it is more severe, then you can increase epitropium or increase the dose of inhaled corticosteroids. As I mentioned to you, inhaler are the best way of giving. Usually people think that children cannot have inhalers, but there are different ways of giving inhalers. So everybody can get an inhaler, even if it is an infant. And so it is, you should know how to give an inhaler to young people. So in the end, I'm just going to just take, to finish with the take home message. The asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder. Inhaled corticosteroid is the main stay of the treatment. Peak flow meter is essential for diagnosing and assessing the severity. Management should depend upon the level of the control and the choice should be, and choice of the inhaler should be that the person can easily use them. Thank you very much. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, as in the previous I mean, lecture, I've just mentioned about the treatment of asthma, the chronic stable asthma, but some patient may come with acute severe asthma to you. I mean, usually they come or land up in the emergency department. So we assess whether this acute exacerbation of asthma is mild, moderate, severe, or it is a life-threatening type of asthma. So there are different ways of assessing that. If a person comes to you walking, he can lie down, he can speak normally, he's not agitated, his respiratory rate is slightly increased, this will be mild. On the contrary, severe, I mean, uh, he will be breathless at rest, he will not be able to, I mean, talk properly, he will not be able to uh, complete a single, I mean, he, he will talk in simple words, not in sentences. Uh, uh, he was going to talk like that and he bar bar ruk ruk ke wo baat karega. that means he is in a very acute state he may be agitated his respiratory rate may be greater than 300 or sometimes they can if they are becoming drowsy they are becoming tired exhausted that is a very severe form of asthma which is we call as life-threatening asthma again Further, you can see whether the patient has been using his accessory muscles or not, is he has got a wheezing or not, is his pulse rate is kitna hai, or peak flow up check kar sakte. If it is over 50 per 80 percent, these are mild exacerbation, you can treat them and send them home. But if it is severe, if he's been using a lot of accessory muscle, there is a loud wheezing, pulse is 120, peak flow is less than 60 percent of his predicted, and he is not showing any response to your immediate treatment, then it is a severe asthma. This patient needs to be admitted to the hospital. Again, there are certain signs which is considered to be life threatening, like paradoxical abdominal movement that is during inspiration, the abdomen comes out and expression it goes in. But if it is happening in the opposite direction, that means his diaphragm is getting exhausted and it is in the impending respiratory failure. Similarly, silent chest, normally you have a wheezing, but if it is a silent, it is a significant. Similarly, bradycardia. 
if you have got cyanosis, these are all life-threatening as the, uh, the signs in an asthmatic patients. You do ABGs. If you find uh, that PO is normal, PCO2 is low, that is considered to be mild or moderate asthma. But for any reason, if uh, during uh, room air, if the PO2 is less than 60, or carbon dioxide increase from normal level that is considered to be 45, it is, even if it is reaching to 45, this means it is a very severe or life-threatening episode. Similarly, if you see the pulse oximetry, the saturation normally should be above 95%, but if it is dropped to less than 90%, it's a very severe asthma. And uh, so how do we manage that? I mean, first, a brief history. You don't have much time to spend on the taking history. You give them bronchodilator through the nebulizer. Here, we are talking about nebulizer, not inhaler. So acute stage patient cannot use inhaler. So you give them nebulizer, you give them oxygen, you give them steroids. And that is again, sometimes an injectable form. Uh, you should avoid giving any uh, sedation or any cough syrup to these patients. If the patient shows a good response to your initial treatment, you can give, send them home on oral uh, steroids. But if the patient do not show any significant response in the first hour or so during your emergency treatment, this patient has to be admitted admitted either in the ward or in the ICU. If you have a life-threatening asthma, the patient has to be admitted in ICU. But if it is mild to mod moderate to severe asthma, you can keep them in the ward. So what do you do? You give them frequent nebulization, IV steroids, and oxygen therapy. If they are not improving, take them to the ICU where you have a facilities for ventilating these patients on the ventilators. You may use other medicines like aminophilin, but people like to avoid this drug. And if the blood gases deteriorate and the patient goes into respiratory failure, then I'm afraid you have to put them on ventilators. So this is how we manage the uh, acute severe asthma in ICU. Thank you very much.